about said then maneuverability the other very obvious thing about the f-16 is the 9g capability the reclined seat you're going from the f4 which i know was you know lo- loved by many but maybe wasn't the best uh turning fighter um what sort of adjustments did you have to make did you have a a, a, a sort of pro- a program or a process where you built up to pulling 9Gs or did you just go straight from the F4 into the F16 and do whatever you wanted? You went straight from the F4 into the F16 because nobody really knew that much about what was going to happen. Um, F16 was extremely maneuverable. A clean A model was unbeatable in a visual fight. And I know the F15 and the F18 guys are going to moan and groan about that, but it was the truth. That thing was just a beast. It could do double elements. You'd start at 450, 500 knots, do one element, still have 300 knots, do another element. So they, they couldn't outclimb you. They couldn't outturn you. You didn't have to worry about over G in the plane because the computer took care of that. So an F-15 had to blend his Gs in slowly and control them. And the F-16, you could just go, give me nine. And as much as I don't like to admit it now, some basic fighter maneuvering in the visual fight came down to just two things, throttle AB, stick full left and hold and hold it there till the airplane turned around and got behind him and then uncage the missile and shoot or go to guns. So it was, uh, it was maneuverability was beyond anything that we'd ever imagined. Um, you got to the point where you realized you had to be in fairly good shape to sustain these G's. 9Gs is is hard to do. I mean, that G suit is cutting you in half. You have to ease off occasionally just so you can breathe. Um, the, the reclined seat was meant to do two things, really. One, it reduced the distance between your brain and your heart so that the heart didn't have to pump blood quite as far up to keep it in your brain. But it also lowered the profile of the canopy just a little bit. So it was kind of a twofer. But the thing was, you're leaning back in this seat and you don't fly offensive BFM like this. You fly it like this. So you so you got a 30 degree seat. What amounts to is you've got a 30 degree bend at your six, seven cervical vertebrae. And a, a lot of guys had to have neck surgeries because of that. So you had to basically go to the gym. You had to lift some weights. You had to do some running and you had to do neck exercises. They had to, you know, to do 10 of these and 10 to the back and 10 to the side and 10 to the front, trying to build up your neck muscles. The hardest fight you ever had in an F-16 was a similar fight against another F-16. I mean, it was just a G pulling contest to see who could sustain the most Gs for the longest period of time. If you were defensive, your head typically flopped back against the seat and you'd my arm was stronger than my neck muscles. If I wanted my head to move left, I'd grab my oxygen mask, my left hand, and I'd pull my head over that way. And my head would then be trapped. And I could look behind me and fly the defensive BFM. If there was ever a reversal, I'd grab the oxygen mask and I'd push it over to the right. So my head was over there looking right. Uh, at, at eight or nine Gs, everything weighs more. Your head weighs more and every your blood weighs more. Everything weighs more. And it was a... Um, it was a thing that you needed to be in better shape to fly that F-16. The clean A model, uh, as I said, was just, it was the most maneuverable thing I've ever flown. But then two things happened where they took some of that maneuverability away from us. First was, if the generator, it was an electric jet. It needed the electrics to fly. And the things that really needed electrics to fly were the flight control computers. There were four of them. If the generator dropped offline, emergency power unit came online to provide electrics for the airplane. This was in the early days. Later on, they changed a lot of the electrics. The, the emergency power unit had a primary and a standby speed controller on it to keep it from overspeeding. But in the early days, neither one of those were working very well or as well as they should have. And the emergency power unit was coming on and was overspeeding, which was putting an overvoltage into the flight control computers. The A computer, which was the master, would detect this and just say, I can't take this voltage. You're going to burn the computers up. And it would shut down inputs to the flight control computers. Now, if your yaw channel goes to zero, your rudder centers and not much happens. If your roll channel goes to zero, your aileron center 
and you're going to crash eventually, but probably not in the next three or four seconds. But if that horizontal stabilizer goes to neutral, depending upon the speed, you're going to crash right away. And this is going to be impossible to see, but the, the speed curve, the way it was, it would go way down and then it would jump way up and then it would kind of flat. And where we were running around in our speed was right around up here, where if that horizontal stabilizer went to neutral, you got like minus 10 negative G's. I uh, hope the guy doesn't mind using his name, but there was a guy named John Carey who was going into Buckley one day and his generator fails. The emergency power unit comes online. It overspeeds. Everything goes to neutral. He gets this big minus negative G's. His shoulders are up against the canopy. He can't reach the ejection handle. It does an outside Immelman, but the negative G, negative angle of attack, bled so much airspeed down. He's now down in that positive G area. It pendulums back down. I think he was like 90 nose down with two or 3,000 feet to go. He pulls the handle, never figuring he's going to get out, but wanted everyone to know that he that he didn't give up. He tried to the very end, and he wanted to die outside the airplane. He got two or three swings in the chute and hit the ground. Uh, John's face was black and blue from all the blood that had gone up to his head while he was under these negative Gs, but he got out of it. A couple months later, there was a guy up at Hill. I won't use his name. Uh, he was on the range. General Dynamics was out there with film crews filming it. And he experiences this same thing. And they watch his airplane start flying like this. And he wasn't able to. He, he did eventually, I think, get to the handle. But either he didn't clear the plane or he just barely cleared the plane and didn't get a full shoot. And he died. So that grounded the airplanes. Two things came out of that. One, they put a third speed controller on the emergency power unit. But two, they said, if we take away a degree and a half of horizontal stabilator authority from them, then that will shift this graph to where, where they're normally running around and they're up here in the area that's minus 10 negative Gs. Now they'll be down here in the area where they're positive 10 negative, positive 10 Gs, and at least they can reach the ejection handle. So that took away some of our maneuverability. The next thing that happened was the leading edge flap program was a very aggressive program to give it the very aggressive maneuverability the plane had. It was so aggressive that on a couple airplanes, the torque tube that was controlling these leading edge flaps broke and the flap just went straight up in the air on the leading edge of the wing. I don't remember if we lost a plane because of that or if we almost lost a plane or two because of that, but the result was they softened that leading edge flap program and that, again, took some of our maneuverability away. Still a great airplane, but now we're sort of equal to an F-15A. And then, of course, later on when they went to the C model, they added about 2,000 pounds to it to accommodate the lantern pods. And that, again, took away some of the performance. Still a great maneuvering airplane. Did, did you always have, is it 27 degrees AOA limit? Did you always have that? I thought it was 25 degrees. My, you're uh, probably right. I'm just trying to, uh, I only know. It from, from uh, Yeah, it, it, it did. And it would, so it would take you, if you were in a hard turn at nine G's, it would keep you at nine G's as the airspeed bled down, bled down. It would take you to 25 degrees angle of attack and it would hold you there. Uh, there were certain things you couldn't do because of that. You couldn't, like in the F4, we would teach stalls, you know, landing configuration stalls where you'd get the airspeed down, you'd get the buff, and you'd have to recover it. F-16, you couldn't do that. You had to power it idle and put the gear down and stuff. At level of flight, it would, the angle of attack would increase, 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 until it got to 25 degrees angle of attack, and then it would put you in a 7 to 800 foot per minute rate of descent at 25 degrees angle of attack. So it was, that was always there. Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.